Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, I welcome you to my question today. And to the folk who will be watching the internet in an hour's time, we welcome them as well. You may remember I was here last week, but I'm not going to spend as long at the front. All I'm going to do is welcome the Reverend Richard McElhatton as convener of the vacancy. You're welcome, Richard. And wish him and ourselves and my Christian church all the best as we head through this vacancy. So, Richard, over to you. Thanks very much, John, for your, for your welcome. And it's good to be with you. I'm sure you've been wondering over the last few months as you've heard the name of this fella, Richard McElhatton. Who is he? What's he like? Um, well, you're going to find out a little bit about that today, whether or not that's a good thing. I'll leave it for you to work that out. Um, but I'm glad, um, glad to be here, here with you um, today. As, uh, as John has said, and as you've heard, my name is, is Richard McElhatton. I'm the minister of, of Christchurch Presbyterian in Dundonald, just on the, the bottom end of Ballybean Estate. I've been working there for the last 13 years. I've been there as minister. Before that, I was assistant minister up in, in Ebrington in Derry, stroke, stroke London Derry. I was up there for three or four years. Um, I'm originally from, from Carrick. Um, I grew up in, in, in Carrick, um, and I've been um, serving in ministry for those years since. I'm married to Julie. Um, I've been married for 13 years as well. Came to Christ Church and got married in the same year, so it's easy to remember that both of those were 13 years ago. Um, and we have two boys. Isaac is 10, and Reuben is, is 8. Um, they're not here today, they're in Christchurch. I was off on holiday for three weeks. I've been back this week, and them being in Christchurch is a reminder to the people in Christchurch that Richard hasn't taken a week extra holiday, um, but that I am, I am back, and so they're there within, just in their, in their own church and part of, that, uh, part of that today. But I'm sure at some stage along the way, the family will be here uh, with me at, at some stage to, um, to, to meet you uh, as well. Um, I'll be talking more as we go on through the service today, talking more about the vacancy of what that means, about what my role will be within that, and a little bit about what is going to be happening um, with, with the vacancy. I'm sure you're, you're keen to know about that. We'll, I'll be talking about that more um, as we go on through in the service. Um, but today, it, it marks the beginning of a, of a time of transition. Um, for the last 20, over 20 years, Reverend Robert Beggs has been your, your minister and has served very faithfully in this place, and we want within our service today to give Thanks for that in recognition of Robert's ministry. You've done that already in your own way with it marking his retirement. But we continue to do that to give thanks for what's in the past. Then to look now to this next phase of vacancy and then what may come beyond that. So we are uh, wanting to be thinking about these things as we go through in our service today. But we do all of that within the context of worshipping God, which is our primary purpose as we come here together today to worship God. And we remember who we are as his people. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, it says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. And so we come together today as the people of God, as those who've been called by God, who have been shown mercy by him, who've been brought together as his people, a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. All of these things are true of us through faith in Jesus Christ. And we'll be thinking more about the church as well as we go on through in our service today. All of this is possible because of God and the grace and mercy he has shown to us. And our response to that then is we may declare the praises of him. We're going to, to do that now. We're going to sing two songs as we begin in our service. As we think about thanksgiving and reflection, we sing to God, be the glory. And then as we remember who we are as God's people, we're going to sing, come people of the risen King. And we stand to praise God with the words of both of these songs. Praise the Lord, 
praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus his Son. The glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood. To every believer, the promise of God. For every offender who truly believes that moment from Jesus, a pardon receives. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh God. Jesus the Son, and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he has taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. joy and the wonder when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son, and give him the victory through things he hath delight to bring him praise. Come all and tune your hearts to sing to the morning star of praise. From the shifting shadows of the earth, we will lift our eyes to him. Where steady arms of mercy reach to gather children in. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice, one heart, one voice, so Church of Christ rejoice. Come those whose joy is morning sun, and those weeping through the night. Come those who tell of battles won, and those struggling in the fight. For his perfect love will never change, and his mercies never cease. But follow us through all our days with the certain hope of peace. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice, one heart, one voice, O Church of Christ, rejoice. Come young and old. 
traveled from every land, men and women of the faith. Come those with full or empty hands, find the riches of his grace. Over all the world his people sing, sure to shore we hear them call. The truth that cries through every age, our God is all in all. Rejoice, rejoice, let every tongue rejoice. One heart, one voice, so Church of Christ rejoice. Let's pray now together. Almighty God, we come before you now in worship, worshiping you, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, coming to you as the one who has called us out of darkness and into your wonderful light. Loving God, we thank you that you have done this for us, although we have turned from you in our own sin and rebellion. Each of us has gone our own way, following our own path, But in love you have pursued us. In love you sent your son Jesus into this world so that we could be rescued and restored to you. And then you have placed that call upon our lives. For all who who know you as Lord and Saviour, you have placed that call upon us. And we've been able to respond to it in the power of your Holy Spirit. That we have been called from darkness and into your wonderful light. You have shown us such great mercy, that which we don't deserve, which we could never earn or never repay. So have you loved us in sending Jesus into the world. And in Jesus and what you have done for us by your death upon the cross, willingly giving up your life, taking our sin upon yourself so that we can be forgiven, that we can be restored. And Lord, we thank you that that as you bring us to yourself from darkness and into your wonderful light, You don't leave us on our own in isolation, but you bring us together as a people within your church. And Lord, we thank you that because of what Jesus has done for us, we are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God. Lord, help us to remember who we are as you, as members of your church, believers from all around the world, and as this local expression of the church here in McQuiston. Lord, we thank you for that, for who you have called us to be, And we're reminded here that in response to your goodness that we should declare the praises of the one who has called us. And we come to do that today. And Lord, through all our service today, as we praise you, as we speak to you in in prayer, as we hear your word read and explained, through all of these things today, we ask it will be open to all that you want to say to us, to all that you want to do within us. May our hearts be open to that. And as we come at this time of transition and looking to what is ahead, Lord, we want to commit that to you, to seek your will, your purpose, and your way in all things, that you might be glorified in our lives and in this place, both now and in all that lies ahead. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to talk now to the boys and girls. Good to meet you. Nice to see you. I'll get to know your names, I'm sure, over the next uh, wee while. Um, But for now, my name is Richard. Um, You can call me Richard. You don't have to call me anything else or anything fancy or different. And I'm not even going to challenge you. I'll give you a challenge over the next year or so. If you can learn how to spell my surname, my second name, you'll be doing well. And that goes um, for the adults um, as well. So my name is Richard. Richard McElhatton. And it can take a while to spell McElhatton. McQuiston. My granny was McQuiston before she was married, so I have people in the family, nothing around Bally Money direction, nothing to do with the McQuiston that was of this church, but there's McQuistons in my family, so that one's okay um, for me to learn um, how to spell, because there's some of them going back about four or five generations of my family, and even some of my dad's cousins and things are McQuistons that I would know that, that name. But Richard McElhatton, and Richard is the only bit you need to remember of that. Now, I wonder, have you ever had a time in life where things have changed a lot? Has anybody ever moved house? Have any of you moved house? Yeah, and is that an easy thing, a nicely simple thing? 
I wonder about mums and dads, do they get a wee bit stressed around all of that, the wee bit all uptight, and don't, don't move that, and don't put that there, you've got to get all your things into boxes, and you've got to move them from one house to another house, I'm very glad I've lived in the same house the last 13 years, but before that, I've moved around sometimes, and lived over in England at university, and I've moved at different times um, as well, and it's a big work to be moving house, and to be changing that. What about starting a new school? Have any of you done that? Yeah, maybe you went to nursery and then maybe you went from the nursery into the same school or maybe you went from one nursery then you went to a different school or you went to somewhere else when you're in daycare and they looked after you moving from one place to the next. And what about this year? Has anybody gone into a new school? You may be already at the same school you'll be going to. New class? You're going to be going into a new class? You're going to be getting a new teacher? Maybe you've met your new teachers. Most teachers, all teachers, are really good people. They'll be great when you get there. <laughs> I don't know why we're laughing at that. You'll be great, great time. It's a few weeks come around, but you've plenty of summer to enjoy first, and then you'll be back to school. Um, so things change and different things. And we're talking about change, maybe about changing the house that you live in, maybe changing the school that you go to or the class that you're in. Different things change. Well, this is a time when things are changing a wee bit uh, within the church. Um, because for the last 21 years, now that's longer than any of you have been alive. That's nearly as long as I've been. No, it's not long. <laughs> A wee bit older, twice, twice over, and, and just another year on top of that. Um, but things are changing here within the, the church, because for the last 21 years, a lot longer than you have been alive, the same person has been um, the, the minister here. Robert, or Mr. Beggs, or Grander, whatever you call them, has been the minister here um, within the church over that time. And you've been used to him, along with some other people from the church, standing up at the front. And every now and again, there's been somebody different. But it's a different time now, because I'm going to be here some weeks, but I'll not be here every week. And there'll be lots of different ministers will be coming and other people from the church will be up at the front and standing to talk to you. Um, so there'll be lots of different people that you'll be seeing here um, as part of the church. And so that is something that is, is new, it is different. It's exciting for me and for the other people. The other people that come here as well, they tell me they're glad to come here. They like to see you, the boys and girls, and to see all the different people um, that make up the church in, in McQuiston. And it's great for us to come, different people to come and to meet you and to see what is going on here. But it is a little bit different in terms of what is going on. And there's one verse in the Bible that helps us to think especially when things are different and things are changing. It says this, Hebrews 13, verse 8. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Now, this is a verse, I think, is a very important verse. It's a very useful verse for us to know and for us to think about and to remember because there's times when things change. And this is a verse that I've thought about a lot over the last couple of years. Because over the last couple of years, lots of things have changed. There's been times you were in school and you were at home from school and there's times when you think you could do and you couldn't do. And lots of things have been different and not the way that we wanted them to be. Things have changed a lot over the last couple of years. But Jesus Christ is always the same, the same yesterday and today and forever. And as things change within the church here, a wee bit different over this time, it'll be different again, a bit coming forward in the future. But what we remember is Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. Things can change within our lives and the house that we live in, the school that we go to, sometimes things within our families can, can change, things can change within our church. But through all of these things, one thing is the same. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever. And that is a good thing. Because the Bible tells us about how Jesus loves us, about how he died for us, how he continues to care for us, about how one day he will take all of those who have trusted in him to be with him forever in heaven. Wonderful things that Jesus has promised. And we can be absolutely sure that these things are true, that they will continue to be true. And Jesus is always there for us. So lots of things can change within our lives, within our church, within school. All of these things can change but one thing the same, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. It's good for us to remember that, boys and girls, when you're young. It's good for us to remember that whatever stage we're at in life, to know that Jesus Christ is the same. Lots of things can change around us, but Jesus is constant. He is loving, he is good, and he is there for us through all of these things. Let's pray for a wee moment together. Lord, we thank you that you, you never change. We thank you for the truth of your word, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, and today and forever. Speaking about yesterday, not just the day before today, but all the years going past, thinking about today and forever, all the time that lies ahead. Jesus Christ is the same. He is loving and good. He cares for us, is compassionate towards us, and all that is promised is true, and that will happen. We thank you for that. And as things change at times within our own lives, sometimes in our families and where we go to school and where we live, all sorts of things can change. Things can change within, in, in the church but we thank you that Jesus is the one who is always there, who is always the same and is always good. Help us to remember that and to be thankful for it. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
And we're going to, to sing now together as we think about the, the things that change and things that are different. We remember that our God is, is the same, that he is good, and he is there with us to give us help. My God is so big, so strong, and so mighty. And if you know actions, you can join in with actions for this as well. And then afterwards, you can go and continue on with your own things afterwards as well. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are His, the valleys are His, the stars are His handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. The mountains are his, the valleys are his, the stars are his handiwork too. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. You want to go on out to the back there? Go on, go on, go on ahead. A few announcements, just starting with some general announcements. Um, the uh, prayer meeting this Wednesday evening, half past seven. I encourage you to come along for that Wednesday meeting to pray this Wednesday at, at half past seven. Then next Sunday morning, the, the service will be led by Reverend Noble McNeely uh, is here uh, for the service next, next Sunday. And then um, to mention about, about school bags, um, there's been a request for, for support in terms of providing school bags for children for the, the new school year that is coming up from Euston Street um, Primary School. Um, so if you'd like to be involved with that, we're looking um, to provide school bags, lunch boxes, pencils and so on um, for, for five children. And if you can help with that, then please speak to, um, to Linda Ray after the service. We'll be glad to, you can work together on, um, on providing that. It's a real help. We know that these are um, challenging times in terms of finances for people. And when the list comes home from school about these are the things you've got to have for September, well, it brings real fright to some people. And it's great to be able to help practically in that way for people who need it. So please do speak to, uh, to Linda after the service if you would like to be involved. Uh, with, with helping with that. Then um, articles for the, um, the Harvest Pulse magazine, um, those are due in by next September, and if you can speak to John um, about that, about working out whatever articles need to be provided for that, if you can get those to John by, um, by next Sunday so he doesn't have to chase you or chase me. I'm speaking to myself as well. I've been told I have to write for that as well, so I'll be doing that by next Sunday um, as well. So come on now to, um, to speak about the, uh, the vacancy. And in terms of the, the formal thing that I have to do today is to declare to you that the pulpit of this congregation is vacant um, following the, the retirement of the Reverend Robert Beggs. So that's the formal aspect of what to do, to tell you what you already know, that the, that the, that the pulpit here, that, that, that the role of minister here within this congregation is now vacant following, following Robert's retirement. I'm here now as your um, convener. Um, the full title of what I am is the convener of the Vacancy Commission. Um, and so the East Belfast Presbytery is the, the governing body, 23 churches, and it's the leadership across those 23 churches, Presbyterian churches in East Belfast. It has set up a commission, which is a, a, a subgroup. Um, there's nine people together on that commission to look after things through the time of the, the vacancy, and I'm the convener of that group. So you'll hear me described as the convener. I'm the convener of the vacancy commission uh, that East Belfast Presbytery has put in place. Convener is, is fine. You, you get to know what that, what that is. Um, so the commission has responsibility for making sure that the right process is followed through the time of, of the vacancy. And I'm, I will be the one who you will see most often from that. There'll be other times when the commission will be involved, um, but more behind the scenes, I'll be one that you'll see. Um, I will be here roughly every four to six weeks. I'll be here taking the service on Sunday mornings. 
um, and then I'll be organising the, the people in between. Um, Robert very helpfully organised for uh, not only for July when he was in holiday, but also for August to get things started. So he has lined people up for August. I have got basically everything sorted, hopefully from now to Christmas, um, with different people um, coming to preach. Some who've been here before, some others who will be, uh, will be new to that. People will be coming each week, and I'll be here roughly every four to six weeks um, on the, the Sunday morning. I will be uh, looking after things like the session meetings, so I'll be chairing the session meetings, the, co uh, the committee meetings, um, and other aspects of th that kind of planning work within the church. Um, I will be doing some pastoral work. Um, I'm still full-time minister of Christ Church along with, with being here. Um, so in terms of the, the pastoral work that I'll be, be doing, I'm very grateful for um, volunteers within the church, and also um, David Maxwell will be involved a bit with that as well. Um, but I will be, be available um, as needed. And sometimes it's people's concern when a uh, time of vacancy comes, they'll say, well, what happens if I'm in hospital? Or what happens if a, a loved one dies during that time? Well, I will most likely be the one who will be looking after that. Or if I'm not able to do that, I will ensure that someone else is. People worry, well, will there be somebody? Well, yes, absolutely there will. Um, often it will be me or some, someone else if, I, if I'm not, not able to do that. So um, those pastoral needs will, will be covered. Um, but you can speak to your, um, to your elder or members of the pastoral team within the church um, as well. But I'm, I'm happy to be contacted. Uh, my contact de details will be made, made available. I'm happy to be to be phone me or email me or whatever, but I won't have time to be able to start and go around and see a whole lot of people within the church just within the time frame of what is. So in terms of the, um, the, the vacancy, um, the most common question that anybody ever asks in terms of vacancy is, how long is this going to take? There's no simple answer to that, um, but what I would say is that um, a vacancy is rarely filled within in less than a year, um, so if it's done with a year, that's relatively... Uh, relatively quick in that sense. Sometimes it takes a little bit, um, a little bit longer. Um, but it, it's important to know that because you maybe have Methodist friends, and if the Methodist church is changing, the minister goes out the back door in the morning, and the new minister comes in the front door in the afternoon, and that's what seems to happen within their manses. Within our Presbyterian way, there's a time for the vacancy. There's things that need to happen within this time, and this is so. It, Thinking about a year is not out of the question, but there's no guarantee that, that it would be just that. But it's important that you have an idea of that, that the new minister is not going to be here for Christmas. The important thing more so than thinking, well, how quickly can we get this done is how can we get this done well? And uh, choosing the, the right person is, is important for that. If you think over the history of previous ministers, the last one's here 21 years, so we, ministers before that will have been here for um, significant periods of time, I imagine. You don't want to rush to get somebody in and a few months later be thinking, did we make, did we make the right choice? So it's important to um, have the right person come, the person of God's choosing for this place uh, at this time. And there are various stages in the process to go, to go through. There may be times when you're sitting thinking, well, that's been three months now. What really has happened? I haven't seen much happen yet. Particularly in the earlier stages, there's quite a lot needs to go on um, behind the scenes. Um, there's a steady series of things will be happening. Um, and so on Tuesday evening, um, there's the, the policy group are meeting. There's a lot of forms and things that have to be filled in. So we'll be meeting on Tuesday evening to get, to get moving in those forms. Some work has already happened in that. More will be completed uh, w within that. Then there's a series of different permission that will be needed and that will work out the way in which um, things, things proceed. Um, in that first half of, of the process, uh, we need to get to a point of receiving leave to call a, a new minister. Um, that permission ultimately comes from the Linkage Commission. Some of you have been through these things before will have known it as the Union Commission, but that's the body within the Central Presbyterian Church. So we need to get paperwork and everything sorted from within the congregation and with session and so on. Then it needs to go to the Presbytery and then on to the Linkage Commission on behalf of the whole Presbyterian Church. And that takes a number of months to do that. And there's various uh, forums and meetings and all of those things in, in place. Then following that decision, we'll, we'll determine in terms of the, the form of ministry and tenure of ministry that is set in place um, for going forward, and then um, begins the process of, of finding a new minister. There's a bit more input from the congregation in that stage that you'll have a chance later on to be able to um, suggest names of people who may be suitable for that. That will come some way down the line. Uh, and ultimately, uh, within our, our Presbyterian church and our way of doing things, when the time comes for a new minister to come, the minister is called by the congregation. The decision of who is the minister is not the decision just of, of one person or of a group of people, although there's times when session have a bit more input into that. 
But ultimately, when the new minister comes, that person is called by the congregation, by those who are full and voting members of the congregation, and um, the call is, is issued by the congregation as a whole. So it takes a wee while, but there's involvement um, w w within that. And that's just a brief overview of that. If you have any particular questions about it, you can, you can ask me about that. Um, but in the times when I'm, I'm here, I will be keeping you up to date um, with the, the process and the different stages um, as we go through in that. But what I want to encourage you to do, especially through the time of vacancy, is to, to be praying. Um, God knows already who the next minister of this church will be. It's the job for us to discern and to fall into place with what his will and purpose is. We needn't be afraid. Um, but we want to be seeking him, and also to be seeking him not only for the filling of the vacancy, but through this time of vacancy of all that he wants to do in and through this place. And I'll be talking more about that um, in, a, in a few, few minutes' time. But we can be praying, and at times are given to come and pray, the likes of Wednesday evening, at other times that we will have to be praying for the vacancy. I encourage you to be doing that on your own, to be praying yourself in your own devotions through the week, but also when there's times to come together and pray within the church. And maybe you haven't been in the practice of coming to prayer meetings and things like that, I'd encourage you to come and to be praying throughout the time of this vacancy. And we're going to do that, that now. We're going to come um, to God in prayer. And often when we come in a time of prayer like this, we pray for lots of different things, different circumstances and things going on in the world. Other times, absolutely. Um, but today we're not, not thinking um, really beyond the life of this church just for this particular time um, of prayer today. And what I want to do within this time is to, just as we are at this moment of, of transition from the, the ministry immediately that has just um, come to a close with, with, with Robert's retirement um, and looking to the future to think on those things and to begin with, I want to, to give thanks for, for Robert's ministry, which I'm sure you've, you've done within your own marks, but also just to do that at this point of, of transition as well. And I want to just to encourage you for a moment to think, well, what are some of the blessings that you've known over the last 20 or so years? What are some of the ways that that has, has impacted you personally? Maybe there's been something that you've learned, maybe a difficult time that you've been helped through. Maybe it's been a significant time that you've come to faith during that time, or you've grown in your faith, or you've stepped out in some new form of service, or a, a difficult time during your life that you've known, known help from, from within that time. Maybe there's some significant things that you can point to. Or it may just generally be the faithful feeding of God's word to you week by week that has helped you to grow. And there's not so much one point that you, you look to, but just that general feeding of it. Somebody um, compared the faithful preaching of God's word to the, to the dinners that we eat. I wonder, could anybody tell me every dinner you've eaten over the last month or over the last 20 years? No. But you're sitting here healthy today because of all of those meals that you've eaten. And you're sitting here with a spiritual health today because of those sermons that you've received and that, that, that pastoral leadership that you've received over the last 20 years and others who've gone before that has helped to contribute to your, your spiritual health and, and, and your growth. And so it's good to be thankful for that and then also to look ahead. So and we'll take time within our, our prayers to give thanks for that and then to look um, at the vacancy and what's, what's coming as well. So let's um, come again now to God in prayer. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that we can come to you in prayer and we come today at this time of, of transition within this congregation. And as we begin now looking back to what has been thinking um, over the ministry of Reverend Robert Beggs over these last 21 years, giving thanks to you for that, having given, giving thanks for others who have served faithfully in this place before that and others who have served alongside Robert within those years. And Lord, we want to take a moment of, of quiet and stillness just to bring our own particular thanks to you, whether for one significant moment or point within that or significant feature of that ministry or for the general faithfulness that has, has been there throughout that time. Taking a moment of stillness to think on that and to give you your own personal thanks for that. Lord, we thank you um, today as we 
come into this time of vacancy, Lord, we thank you for the ministry that has gone before this, of Robert's ministry in, in this place, and for his faithfulness to you, of how he has sought to serve you faithfully in his preaching here week by week, in his pastoral care within the congregation, in his leadership in this place, and in all that, that you have called him to do, of how he sought to serve you faithfully in these things, and we thank you for him, and we pray that you will bless him and, and Karen and the family now into this transition into retirement, that they might know your blessing, your presence with them, and your leading for them now is this time of refreshment and into all that you have for them ahead within life. Lord, we pray that you will bless them and be with them in every sense. And for the ministry here and um, within McQuiston, for particular moments of, of times of people who have, have come to faith here within these last number of years, of people who have grown within their faith, of people who have stepped out into new forms of service, uh, for people who have known help through difficult times, through times of loss and of bereavement, of sickness, of other challenges that have been faced, for your faithfulness to them and how that has been helped through the ministry here over these years. Lord, we want to thank you for all of these things and for so much more. And Lord, as we come into this time of, of vacancy, Lord, we thank you that you are, are still in charge. We thank you that we come just as we were, were singing a, a few minutes ago. That you, our God, are so big, so strong, and so mighty. There's nothing that you cannot do. And we come looking to you, trusting in you for what lies ahead. For these coming weeks and, and months as the vacancy begins and the transition that, that that brings and for different roles and responsibilities that people take on, Lord, we pray that you'll help them in doing that in your strength. And Lord, for all that will follow through this time of vacancy and to what's ahead, we want to commit that to you, seeking that your will will be done, that your purpose would be achieved in, in this place. Lord, we know that just as you have been faithful, so you will continue to be faithful. Lord, help us by the strength of your Holy Spirit to be faithful to you, that you will lead us on through this time of, of vacancy and into all that is ahead. In the power of your Holy Spirit, being faithful to you, seeking your glory in this place, in this community, in this area, and all that you want to do. So we commit all of these things to you. In Jesus' name, amen. And we turn now to, to read from, from God's word. Our reading this morning is from, from Matthew chapter 16, um, verses 13 to 20, and page 930 on the Church Bibles if you want to. Um, to, to turn to it there. So Matthew chapter 16, reading from verse 13, this is God's word. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Jesus, answered, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the, kings of the, the keys of the kingdom of heaven, Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he ordered his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Amen. And we thank God for his word. So I have done my formal job this morning. And that which is told to do on the first Sunday of the vacancy, it's usually the convener that declares that the congregation is vacant. So I've done that. But I now want to set that within the wider context and the wider setting of what that means for the life of the church here. So it is true officially and formally today that Mocustom Memorial Presbyterian Church is now vacant in the sense that, that you don't have a minister. But in many other ways, and really in every other sense, the church is far from vacant if people tell you you're vacant, don't believe it. You can say, well, yes, it's true, in the sense of, yes, we, we don't, we don't, I've missed a hymn. Um, <laughs> what will we do? Um, we'll 
we'll sing it in a few minutes' time. We'll come back to it, it's okay. In our own church, we go straight from the reading into the sermon. That's probably why you who is real stand waiting for that is. <laughs> that is. There we go. Uh, I'll carry on. So when people tell you you're vacant, you know what you mean, and that you don't have a, a, a minister at, at, at the minute. But in every other sense, the church is far from vacant. The elders are still in place. The committee is still doing its role. The congregation is here. All the generations of the church are still part of what's going on. The congregation is here. The church family is, is still existing and in worshiping in this place. So in every other sense, um, the church is not, it's not vacant. The, the role of minister is vacant, but in every other sense, the church is not vacant. And even more important than, than all of that as well, the eternal head of the church is still in place. We read it a couple of minutes ago, those words of Jesus when he said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades or the gates of hell will not overcome it. And so while one particular post is vacant, the church as a whole is not. And what I want to say to you today is that as we go through this period of vacancy, there is much that God wants to do in this place and through this place over these coming months and in, in what is ahead. There can be a temptation when vacancy comes to almost feel like you're pressing pause, right? Everything's on hold. Let's not move anything. Let's not do anything. Let's just wait until we get a new minister. But that's not the, that's not the way to treat a vacancy, to treat it as if everything um, is on hold. There's much that God wants to do in and through this place over this coming months. And I want us to think about that in terms of those words, that simple phrase that Jesus uttered, but with so much meaning to it, to mention three things that come from those words of Jesus. The first of those things is to say that the church belongs to Jesus. Jesus said, I will build my church. The church belongs to Jesus and is, is precious to him. And when the Bible speaks about the church, it does so in, in two main ways. Sometimes it refers to a local congregation like this. As we go on through the New Testament, a number of letters are written to local churches. And so you'll read that Paul will write to the church in Rome, to the church in Corinth, to the church in, in Ephesus. Local churches, congregations of people meeting in a physical place as they, as they gather to worship God. So sometimes when it talks about a church, it refers to a local congregation but at other times, such as when Jesus is speaking here, it's not talking about a single congregation, but the church in a universal, in a global sense, talking about the church as the body of all Christians through all time, and telling us that Jesus is the head of the church, that whole body belongs to him, and the body of the church consists of everybody who has put their trust in Jesus Christ as Savior. So at the point when you put your trust in Jesus, repenting of your sin, putting your trust in him as Savior and asking him to be Lord of your life, taking you on, well, you're at that point you're set right with God, so you're restored to him. That gap between us and God is fixed. Our relationship with God is restored. But alongside that, and part of what comes with that, is membership of his body, the church. We become part of his family, the, the, the church. That comes automatically at that point when you become a Christian. We become part of the church. If you think about membership of different organizations, you can ask, well, what does it cost to become a member of that organization? If you want to become a member of a golf club, there may be a fee that you have to pay up front and then a regular subscription that you pay for your membership to be kept. The same if you want to be a member of a gym, you'll pay maybe so much of a joining fee or they'll tell you you're getting a great deal because you don't have to pay the joining fee this month but all you have to pay is so much for the, for the rest of your life until you can manage to escape. Different organizations have different fees and costs that it takes for them to be a, 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 fix for you to be a member. What about the church? What does it cost to be a member of the church? Well, the answer to us is that it, it costs nothing in that initial sense. It costs us nothing. You can't buy a membership of the church. There's nothing you can pay for it. It is something that is a gift that is, is given to us that we freely receive when we put our trust in Jesus. But what did it cost Jesus for us to be members of the church? Acts 20, Paul is talking to the elders in Ephesus and he says to them, giving them a charge as elders, Acts 20 verse 28, he says to them, be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. 
The church belongs to Jesus, and Jesus has every right to say, I will build my church because the church belongs to him because he brought it into being by the shedding of his blood upon the cross. What did your membership of the church cost? Your membership of that global body of Christians, what did it cost? It cost the blood of Jesus being shed on the cross, which he bought with his own blood. That's what it cost for the church to come into being. That's what it cost for you and I to be members of that church. And Jesus willingly paid that price for us. And so when Jesus says, I will build my church, well, that's a good thing. It's an encouraging thing for us that he is the one who has taken ownership of the church, who has brought us in um, to membership of his church. And what a privilege to do that. There are certain clubs and societies that people feel honored to be a part of, and they pay their fees and whatever all it takes. There's no body on this church that's a greater thing to be a part of than the church of Jesus Christ. Than to be part of that as we put our faith in him and we receive what Jesus bought for us by his death upon the cross. Being a member of that church is the most wonderful and exclusive body that you can be part of. And it's open to everyone who'll put their trust in Jesus. So that's the membership of the church in that universal and that global sense. But the way that we then express that in, in, a, in a visible sense is through the local church like this. Through membership of a local congregation and our involvement and commitment to that. Because it's not God's design that we would become Christians and then live in, in some sort of isolation. He desires us to come together and not just with a loose association with other people, but joining together within a local church, committing ourselves to a local congregation and getting involved within that. And I'll talk a wee bit more about that in a minute. But what we see at this first stage is that the church belongs to, to Jesus Christ. He is the head of the whole church. He brought it into being by shedding his blood and he continues to be involved with the church. He continues to be, as we use the expression sometimes in the, the formal language of the church, that Jesus Christ is the sole king and head of the church. He is the one who's in charge of it. He brought it into being by his own blood being shed on the cross and he continues to be the head of the church, leading it and so deeply involved within the whole work of the church. The church belongs to Jesus Christ. And so if you'd ask the question, well, who does McQuiston belong to? Well, it belongs to, to Jesus Christ. Now, it's not wrong for you to say McQuiston is my church. If you're driving down the road and you point there and say, that's my church, that's a good thing. But there's two ways that you can say that's my church. One way is by saying, that's the church that I belong to, that I'm part of the family in it, that I want to commit myself to, to serving in that place. It's a place where I go to grow, to help me in my Christian life and discipleship. I'm identified and I'm part of that church and I want to do that and be committed to that. That's a good way of saying that's my church. The wrong way of saying is that's my church and they're going to run things in the way that I want and they're going to do everything that pleases me and every part of everything that goes forward, we better make sure it's to my pleasing because that's my church. In that second way, the church belongs to Jesus Christ. Don't dare say that's my church when the church belongs to Jesus Christ. But in the other way, that's my church. I'm committed to that place. Good, okay? So if you can get the right my in that, you're doing okay. Hopefully you understand the difference between those two. But across it all, it's a great privilege for us to, to, to know that the church belongs to Jesus Christ. It gives us confidence. There's times when we come into vacancy, you're thinking, oh dear, does that mean it's over to, over to us now, over to the, to the clerk who's trying to pass that mantle on to somebody else? And I'm sure there's somebody willing from session ready to take that over. They've fallen the clerks, they've fallen the elders. Who, who, who's looking at this? They've fallen me as, as convener. Who's, who's looking after things? Well, Jesus Christ has continued to look after things. It gives us a great confidence and assurance, but also that desire to, to please him and to want to honor him in all that, that, that is going on. So throughout the vacancy and at all times, we look to Jesus, the one who has given himself for the church, the one who wants the very best for us. And we can see that by the sacrifice that he has made we look to him in all things, seeking his will and his purpose. So within that phrase, Jesus says, I will build my church, belongs to him, but we also say, Jesus saying, I will build my church. The church is being built by Jesus. And so he is not the founder who has founded the church and put his name on it and then somehow walked away and, and left it to get on with it to its own devices. He is not some distant CEO sitting in an office somewhere. He continues to be deeply involved in the sense that he is the head, the church is his body, that is the link that is there. He is the vine, that we are the branches. Those are the, the kinds of descriptions that are used to show the close link that is there between Jesus Christ 
and his church. He continues to be so intricately involved in it, deeply concerned about what goes on there in the midst of it. And without him, nothing of value can happen. Psalm 127 verse 1 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, its builders labor in vain. Nothing of value or of worth happens unless it's being built by, by Jesus. But yet at the same time, in the way that Jesus builds his church, he chooses to involve us as his people. And in the midst of that passage that we read, that he is giving authority to Peter to take a role of leadership within the church, he's delegating. As he knows he's going to be leaving the earthly scene, he wants to hand over responsibility. He continues to be head of the church and deeply involved, but he hands over responsibility to us within the church, to roles of leadership and to other roles of service within the life of the church. 1 Corinthians um, chapter 3, verse 9, it describes us there that we are God's fellow workers. So yes, the church is being built by Jesus, but the way that he chooses to do that is by involving us with the different skills and the gifts, the opportunities, the means that he gives to us. He involves all of us in his church. So yes, Jesus builds the church, but he involves us in the way of doing that. So we don't want to run on ahead and do our own thing, building in vain without him. But we don't just sit back thinking, well, he's going to do it all. He's got jobs for us. And the way that he wants to do that is, is through us and our willingness um, should be there uh, to do that. And as we think about building the church, what, do, what does it mean? Well, we think about building in two, real, two, two main senses that, that that happens. One way is that, is that the church grows. It is built as new people join it. And so when people become Christians, they become part of the church in, in its universal sense. But it's also good that people then would join in within a local church. It's right that people would come, declare their faith, and come in full membership within a local congregation. And around the world, that, that continues to happen as people put their trust in Jesus and come part of, of his church. But the local church has a part to play uh, within that. That individually within our own lives, as we go about our lives day by day, and collectively within the ministry and, and the work and the outreach of the church, we have an opportunity to present people with the good news of Jesus Christ, to share the gospel with others as, as well. And we show that by our life lived out together within the church. Now, this doesn't come as news to you that it's the role of the church to be reaching out. It's something that we're to do. But that's one of the ways that the church is built as we reach out, as we reach new people, as we see people coming to faith in Jesus Christ and coming in then to membership of the church. The other way in which building happens within the church is for us as people who have become Christians, as we are, are built up, as we grow in our faith. So yes, you need to take that step to become a Christian, to put your trust in Jesus. Absolutely, you're nowhere without it. But then there's a need for us to, to grow up into Christian maturity, to, to be changed. And that's the other aspect of that, of that growth, that just as Jesus saves us by his grace, so his, his work continues within us to change us and to shape us, to transform us more and more into his likeness. And so if Jesus says, I will build my church do you think that he presses the pause button on his building of his church through the time of vacancy here within this congregation? No, of course he doesn't. Now, the, the work of building his church may be slightly different over this wee while, but it doesn't stop through a time of vacancy, and it's not a time to sit back and simply wait until a new minister comes. Through the vacancy, there are times when people need to step up into things, and there may well have been over the last number of months when Robert has said, can I have a wee word with you? Oh, you wouldn't mind after when I go, you taking this on or taking that on. And some of you may, may have had that experience. So a vacancy is a time when there isn't a minister in place and people within the congregation step up to things, and that's no bad thing. Now, having a minister is, is a good and helpful thing, and, uh, and you'll get to that point hopefully again in, in, in the future. But there's lots of things that members of the congregation can do, and sometimes it's when the minister gets out of the way that people are then freer to do those things, and sometimes reluctantly but step up to doing that. So there's there's ways of, of serving, and that's ways in which you can, can grow and step out within your faith as there are new opportunities of things that come. Now, there may be things that you say, well, you know, we'll wait and we'll decide on that, or we'll start that, or we'll do that, or change that when the new minister comes. It's not always a bad decision to, to put some things off. But the danger can be when that becomes the excuse for not doing anything. Oh, we're in a vacancy. We can't, we can't do that. We can't do that. We can't do that. Maybe one or two things that you'll think, well, we'll leave that to the future. 
but there's plenty that you can do. And plenty that, that, that can go on. So don't let vacancy be an excuse for saying, well, we can't do anything. Maybe the things that you've been asked to do will be enough to keep you busy. Maybe there's, there's new things that you can be, um, can be in, in, involved in doing. And I'm glad to see things coming up. Like there's Messy Church coming up at the start of September and people being involved with things like that. Keep, th- keep things going. And venture in, in new ways and step up and try things and opportunities for things. There's plenty of that can all go on within the vacancy. Remembering that, that, words, that those words of Jesus continue to be true. I will build my church. And he calls on us to be his co-workers in doing that so Jesus has said he will build the church the church belongs to him the last thing that we see within this is that the church will not be, be overcome I will build my church and the gates of Hades the gates of hell will not, will not overcome it these are, are challenging times there's no point trying to, to deny that over the last number of years even the last 40 or 50 years we've seen great decline in numbers within churches across Northern Ireland, across the UK, across Western, Western Europe, there's been significant decline w- w- within churches. There's some congregations which are exception to that, but that the majority case that that is, is, is the truth. And there's times when we can be discouraged. We can think, well, what's, what's the direction? What is the, the future? Where are things going in terms of, of the church? We need to continue to remember what Jesus has said. That he will build his church and the gates of hell will not overcome it or will not, will not stop it. And so the challenge for us then is to say, well, how, how can we be faithful to you, Jesus, and what you're calling us to do now? Because the reality is the church looks different to what it did a generation or, or, or two generations ago. You know that within this place. It's true of, 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 of many churches. And the challenge for us is not to say, well, how do we get back to where we once were? Sometimes that's what we want. How, do we, how can we look back to the good old days? How can we get back to past strength or ways? But the challenge is to say, how can we be faithful to what God is calling us to do in this place and at this time? That may be things being done differently, being structured differently, being worked differently going forwards, but we need to be, to be faithful to that, trusting the work of Jesus. So as I was talking earlier on, yes, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His love is the same. His message of salvation is the same. The word of God is the same, never changes. We continue to be faithful to that. But the ways in which we structure things and function and the ways in which we do things can be different. Time of vacancy can be a time to review some aspects of what goes on in the church. I think coming out of, of COVID and what we've seen over the last couple of years of the pandemic has been also a challenge to think, well, what is it we're being called to do? What is the essential things that we do? What are the things that we once did that we're maybe going to give thanks to God for them and his work in the past, but we're not carrying those things forward? Are there new things that we need to learn and we need to do differently? Maybe there's times of change or things that need to be reviewed and need to be thought about. But most importantly, across it all, committing to Jesus, committing to his work and to his way, seeking him in everything wanting to be faithful to him to his call on this place so these are challenging times for the church and we need to be faithful to God and to his work in this day and this generation but we also need to remember is that the ultimately the future of the church is incredibly hopeful if you read your way to the end of the book where does it take you where does the church end up if you're to listen to some sociologist, they'll tell you by some year, by the, end of the, by the end of this century, the church will not exist. That's not true. When we get to the end, there'll come a day when people of every nation, tribe, and tongue, so many that we cannot number them, are gathered together in heaven. That's the future of the church. That's where the church ends up, gathered by, around Jesus Christ on his throne with people from all, through all periods of time, the faithful people of the Old Testament who put their trust in God, everybody who's become a Christian since the time of Jesus, from every nation, tribe and tongue, from everywhere around the world, through all periods of time, will all be gathered together in heaven around Jesus. That's where it all ends up. This is a difficult time in between, but we need to remember that that, that is where it is going that that is where the future lies for us personally and for, where it lies for, for us as believers. That's what we have to look forward to. 
And not even the gates of hell can overcome it. Even the devil at his best work cannot deny us of where we will be ultimately with him in heaven. It's been secured for us by Jesus, by his death on the cross, and it's promised and guaranteed for each one of us that it will not be overcome. So we look to the future and where things lie, and it's immensely hopeful, and it's a wonderful picture. And that then brings us back into the present, that yes, these are challenging times for us. But until then, let's see the church as Jesus sees it not seeing it as sometimes the way that we can be discouraged by it or even sometimes the way that we like it and wish it to be but seeing the church as Jesus sees it remembering that the church belongs to to Jesus it belongs to him as, as the one who has shed his blood to bring it into being as the one who continues to dearly love the church and every one of us who are part of it remembering that we belong to Jesus we're in his hand and his care Remembering that Jesus is continuing to build his church. We want to be his fellow workers working under him, seeking his way, his purpose, and all that that he is doing. Staying in tune with him so that his church will be built in his way and in his time. That We're walking along with him in doing that. Not laboring in vain, trying to go our own way. But seeing the wonderful work that Jesus is doing and joining in in the ways that he calls us to do. And remembering finally that the church will not um, be overcome. There's no power on earth. There is nothing that can stop the growth of Jesus' church. And the future is immensely hopeful that even death itself for us does not bring our membership of the church to an end, but just as the means by which we transfer on into that eternal place. Wonderful hope comes through faith in Jesus Christ and his place that he gives us within the church. That's the message that we have to share. That is the confidence that we have and the hope that we have um, as we go, go forward. Let's pray now together. Lord, we thank you um, for these words of Jesus when he said, I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. Help us to take great comfort and encouragement from that, knowing that the church belongs to Jesus, that he is the one who has given his life to bring the church into being. He is the one who continues to love us and to care so deeply for us. He is the one who's continuing to build the church and sometimes we fear it all lies on us, but no, it's being done by Jesus and we thank you for that. But yet we're called to be involved in the ways that you have laid upon us. Help us each to step up to that and what you're asking us to do. Lord, help us to be faithful in our response to you, to play our part within the building of the church. And Lord, help us to see the church as Jesus sees it, with its immensely hopeful future of what we know will come one day, being gathered in heaven, all around your throne forever in that perfect place. Lord, help us to remember that, to hold on to that, to share the good news of that, and to praise you with that day in mind. So Lord, as we come into this time of vacancy here within this congregation, may we be faithful to you and responding, remembering your great truth and all that you're calling us to do. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We have two songs left. We'll sing them both. Oh. Okay, so there's planning meetings um, for, for Messy Church, for anybody who has signed up to help with Messy Church. Um, will take place on the 23rd and the 30th of August. Um, so both of those are happening um, at, at half past seven. So that's planning meetings for, uh, for, for Messy Church. Um, I'm glad I'm not the only one who forgets, for, forgets things. Uh, we have two songs. We're going to sing them, sing them both. Um, really much tie, tying in with what, what I've been talking about. The first, um, my hope is built on nothing less. Christ alone, the cornerstone. That soul king and head of the church is the cornerstone of it. And then our, our closing one will be Lord of the Church. Um, we pray for our renewing. Really a prayer, um, a prayer for the church um, of asking for the Lord's renewing of all that's going on. So let's stand and sing. Stand if you're able to sing um, both of these now together. Built on 
nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide his face. I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When He shall come with trumpet sound, Oh, may I then in Him be found. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the Hey, hey. 
Father's blessing, a true repentance and a faith restored, a swift obedience and a new possessing, filled with the Holy Spirit of the Lord. We turn to Christ from all our restless striving, on numbered voices with a single share in the words of the benediction together. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all forevermore, forevermore. Amen.